welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on this channel, we're dedicated to learning about all things organized crime, and I'm very excited to talk with you today about the Mafia's influence in Las Vegas. We do seem to be continuously moving westward in our Mafia coverage, sort of a manifest destiny of organized crime. We have so much to cover today, so let's get right to it. Before we get started, I want to set the scene for Las Vegas' humble beginnings. Long before the glitz and glam, lights and sin that we associate with the city today, it was a stopover for folks on their way to Los Angeles. Rafael Rivera, a member of Spanish explorer Antonio Amijo's trade party gave Las Vegas its name in 1829 when they were on their way to Los Angeles because the valley at the time contained artisan wells surrounded by greenery. Rivera named the area Las Vegas, meaning the meadows. Las Vegas was founded as a stopover settlement in 1905 when the railroad linking Los Angeles and Salt Lake City was opened. Many farmers moved to the settlement and piped fresh water there. In 1911, Las Vegas was incorporated into Clark County and urbanization really began with young men coming in to build the then Boulder, now Hoover Dam. Because of the urbanization from these young men, the mafia stepped in to create a gambling and entertainment space for them. A very important 40 acres of land was originally owned by one of Vegas's first settlers, Charles Squire. In 1944, Margaret Folsom purchased the land. She would then sell it to the Hollywood Reporter owner, Billy Wilkerson. Wilkerson had big plans in Vegas and got to work on his vision, a European-style resort and hotel that differentiated itself completely from what were known as sawdust joints on Fremont Street. He envisioned a hotel with spacious, luxurious rooms, a spa, a health club, a showroom, a nightclub, a golf course, fine dining, and a French-style casino. Wilkerson was ahead of his time, and due to wartime material costs, came up about $400,000 short of his vision. He was in search of financing. Fortunately for Wilkerson, a financier was in close proximity. Gambling and off-track betting were legal in Las Vegas, and thus caught the eye of Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. He had purchased the hotel and casino, El Cortez, on behalf of Meyer Lansky on Fremont Street, but when the city officials found out about his mobster background, they made business challenging for him. Siegel decided to look around for other opportunities, and as fate would have it, found Wilkerson. Siegel posed as a businessman with the corporation he had formed called Nevada Projects Corporation, which does not sound at all suspicious, and purchased two-thirds stake in the project. Siegel acted both in his own interest and in the interest of Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky, the East Coast mobsters we have discussed frequently on this program. Lansky ran the finances for the National Crime Syndicate, and as such, was always finding new investment opportunities. Lansky had been involved in the casino business since the late 1930s in Cuba, and Las Vegas, with their legal gambling, was also on his radar. Initially, the idea had been to focus on off-track horse betting, with results being wired in. But Lansky soon realized the potential for casinos in this desert town, becoming a hidden owner in the Thunderbird, later known as El Rancho Vegas. Siegel came to Lansky for the money to build the Flamingo, he and Wilkerson's vision, and estimated a total cost of $1 million. Lansky agreed. There are a few key rules when using other people's money, investors, to finance your vision. Number one, you want to come with an accurate estimate from the beginning. Number two, you don't want to get caught up in the small details of the project super early in the project. And number three, if you do go over budget, you want to make sure that it's as minimal as possible. You certainly don't want to sextuple the estimate, and that's exactly what Bugsy Siegel did. It is needless to say that if the Mafia is your investor, you certainly want to take these rules all the more seriously. The Flamingo, allegedly named after Siegel's girlfriend Virginia Hill, who loved to gamble and Siegel called her Flamingo because of her long skinny legs, was the first luxury hotel in the Vegas Strip and cost a total of six million dollars to build. Siegel had a vision for Flamingo and he wanted to see it realized. The marble and decorative woods from the black market, especially following World War II, cost a fortune. And to say nothing of construction cost, advertising, and marketing, the fact that he had an escape ladder in the presidential suite, making sure that his racing wire publication Transamerica Wire was the casino's official source for racing results, the lavish opening ceremony, and of course, the money that Siegel allegedly and Virginia Hill definitely skimmed from the top of the Flamingo was an expensive undertaking. The mob investors were furious. Lansky, who had been friends with Siegel for many years, persuaded his organized crime associates not to kill Siegel. After all, if the casino made the money in the end, it would be worth it. A star-studded group were coming to the grand opening of the Flamingo. People like Clark Gable, Lana Turner, Cesar Romero, Judy Garland, and Joan Crawford would all be there for the opening. Surely Siegel, although evidence suggested that he had been skimming, would deliver for his investors. If it was successful, Siegel would pay them back. The opening was a complete flop. This December 26th, 1946 opening was of course bad timing. The day after Christmas is never a time for an expensive event, but aside from that, the dealers skimmed money for themselves. The house lost around $200,000, and on top of that, the construction was incomplete. None of the rooms were guest ready, so many of the Flamingo guests spent the night at El Rancho. During the 65 days it was open, the casino 
casino lost $700,000. The mob investors turned to Lansky again. They wanted Siegel's blood, but Lansky again stuck up for Siegel and insisted that they give Siegel time to close and reopen again in a month. The casino had started turning a small profit. Construction wasn't completed opening, so maybe Siegel could still make them their money back. The Flamingo closed and reopened as the fabulous Flamingo on March 1st, 1947, but again, it lost money for its investors. After holding back the bloodthirsty investors twice, Lansky had no choice. Siegel had been skimming money from the Flamingo and had cost the mob investors a fortune. It is said that Lansky was reluctantly the one who called for Siegel's murder. So, easy question, right? Who killed Bugsy Siegel? Well, I wish I knew. If you think that you have it figured out, let me know in the comments, but here's what we do know. Siegel died on June 20th, 1947, while reading the Los Angeles Times at Virginia Hills Beverly Hills home, when he was shot through the window with a 30 caliber military M1 carbine multiple times, including two headshots, one of them knocking an eye out of its socket. After Siegel's death, Meyer Lansky's men walked into the Flamingo and took control before Siegel's body was even cold. Within 20 minutes of Siegel's death, his men, including Mo Sedway and Gus Greenbaum, took control of the hotel. Greenbaum would be president of the Flamingo and with a $1 million loan from the Chicago Mafia, Greenbaum turned the Flamingo into a success story. In 1950, Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee came to Las Vegas in November to hold a one-day hearing on organized crime. Ironically, this piqued the interest of the Chicago outfit, which at this point began to see the lucrative opportunity and inroads into the Las Vegas crime game. Senator Kefauver's hearing seemed to have the exact opposite effect of what he had intended. Genovese associate in Nevada Clark County Alderman Mo Sedway had been the only one of the five witnesses during Kefauver's hearings to have Mafia ties. The others who had ties were conveniently out of town that day. Sedway testified that he was a sickly businessman and did not have mafia ties, although this was hard to believe due to his evident connection to Lansky and his shares in the Flamingo. Las Vegas Sun editor Hank Greenspun wrote, a sharp 10-year-old boy could have come to the conclusion that crime and politics in this state are on friendly terms. Sedway died in 1952. He had always been in poor health, perhaps the only truth that he had told during his hearing. A visionary though he may have been, Lansky's bad luck with Las Vegas casinos did not stop with the Flamingo. Lansky is quoted to have said, there were times when I thought I would die in that desert. Vegas was a horrible place. Everyone in organized crime was trying to establish a foothold in Las Vegas. And in addition, nearly everyone would struggle to finance the stream. Mo Dolitz, a Boston, Massachusetts native, would soon be known as Mr. Las Vegas after teaming up with the crime group from Cleveland, Ohio, called the Cleveland Mayfield Road Gang, to invest in the Las Vegas gaming scene. Dolitz used his money he had earned from bootlegging to head out west to invest in casinos. Although heavily involved in crime, Dolitz was never charged with one. Dolitz first bailed out the original owner and builder of the Desert Inn, after he had ran out of money for construction. Dalitz, part owner of the United Hotels with Meyer Lansky, lent the money to finish constructing the Desert Inn. Dalitz would then work with Lansky on another investment project for Tony Cornero in the Stardust Casino. Cornero was a former bootlegger and entrepreneur who started his work on casinos with casino boats in Southern California on international waters. Stardust was the casino that the movie Casino was based on, although in the movie the casino was called Tangiers. Cornero borrowed $1.25 million from Dalitz and Lansky. He would then ask for a second, then a third loan. It is believed that Dalitz hounded Cornero so much that he gave Cornero, who had a history of heart issues, a fatal heart attack. After asking for an additional loan of $800,000 to stock the casino with cash and pay for liquor and food suppliers, on July 31st, 1955, Cornero died of a heart attack while playing craps at the Desert Inn Casino. He was down $37,600 at the table. Many speculate that this was a death by poisoning, but the official coroner's report maintains that this was a heart attack. Dalitz would now oversee the Stardust along with Chicago mobster Murray Humphreys. Jake Factor, brother brother of cosmetics mogul Max Factor, would act as the casino's frontman. He had a clean record, so for all intents and purposes, Factor was Stardust's boss. Humphreys, however, did not have a clean record. He had been a soldier under Capone and worked for Salvatore Giancana. He was among the first names to be added to Las Vegas's Black Book, a list of names who were forbidden from entering the city due to their criminality. We'll get into more about the Chicago outfit in Las Vegas momentarily. El Rancho burned down in 1960, and by the mid-1960s, Dalitz and Lansky would cash out, as it were, from the Las Vegas gang when it became evident that it was such a hands-on investment that would ultimately lead to law enforcement shutting them down or making them pay out. They had made their money skimming and scheming. It was finally time to leave what happened in Vegas to stay in Vegas. Dalitz and Lansky even sold the Desert Inn to billionaire Howard Hughes so that he could use it as a tax shelter for less than $15 million. Hughes had tried to buy Stardust in 1966 but was denied because of antitrust laws. The casino was sold in 1969 to a Los Angeles company. It was Anthony Accardo, who had been the Chicago outfit boss since 1947, who was really the man who was able to get his arms around 
around the Las Vegas crime scene. Ricardo brought Gus Greenbaum, the former president of the Flamingo, out of retirement in Arizona to run his casino, the Riviera, in 1955. The casino had been consistently losing money for three months, so Ricardo gave the official on-site owners 15 minutes to get out of Dodge and placed Greenbaum into the leadership role. So fun fact, the inspiration for Mo Green's name in The Godfather is said to have been a combination of Mo Sedway and Gus Greenbaum, both of whom were associates of Lansky, who was the inspiration for Hyman Roth. Accardo was a man who liked to keep a low profile. Greenbaum was not. Greenbaum, who had reluctantly come out of retirement per Accardo's request, was found dead in his Phoenix home on December 3rd, 1958, after Accardo had been put off by his public gambling, drinking, and philandering, and, most importantly, had discovered that Greenbaum had been skimming off the top at the Riviera. Unlike Lansky, Accardo was merciless when it came to running his Las Vegas properties. There was just something about the Las Vegas atmosphere that you did not see in Chicago or New York. Maybe it was all of the lights and glam of the city and casinos, which by the way are designed to make you feel that you have more money to spend than you really do, that sucks even the mafia into biting off more than it can chew. The greed of Las Vegas big shots leads to their own demise at a rate that is unparalleled in other cities. Accardo made the decision to have one outside man in Vegas to oversee the activities. He and Salvatore Giancana, his Las Vegas expert and protege, decided that the brutal Marshal Caifano was the man for the job. Caifano was ruthless and no nonsense. He gained a reputation for using a blowtorch to murder his victims. And if that didn't scare these Las Vegas guys from skimming off the top, I don't know what would've. In 1956, the IRS began putting the squeeze on Accardo, who transferred control of the Las Vegas territory to Giancana, and the following year placed Giancana into the role of acting boss for the Chicago outfit. Within a decade, Accardo would be back in the driver's seat of the Las Vegas scene. Caifano was replaced by Johnny Roselli in 1960. Caifano's name was placed in the Black Book, but he would work his way back into Vegas by the end of the decade. Roselli, a handsome, connected, and influential Italian native, came to the United States at six years old and wasted little time getting into trouble with narcotics in 1922. He was a bootlegger with the Chicago outfit by 1924. Originally used in the 1940s as the outfit's extortionist in Hollywood, Accardo called Roselli to come and take on Las Vegas in 1957. Roselli already knew many of the entertainment figures he would book for Las Vegas shows, including Frank Sinatra, the man whose role he secured in From Here to Eternity, reinvigorating his failing career. And if that sounds familiar to you, then you're probably thinking of Johnny Fontaine from The Godfather, who was based on Frank Sinatra. Roselli was responsible for funding the construction of the Tropicana and the Royal Nevada. In 1959, most, if not all, big talent in Vegas was booked through Roselli and his talent agency, Monte Presser. Salvatore Giancana would step down from his role in the Chicago outfit in 1966. Roselli like Salvatore Giancana, would get involved in the CIA in attempts to take out Fidel Castro and is speculated to have had some connection with John F. Kennedy's assassination by conspiracy theorists. This suspicion would increase when, in 1975, Roselli was called before the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee to testify about the plot to kill Castro. Shortly after his testimony, Giancana was murdered and Roselli went into hiding. Then in 1976, Roselli was called to testify about John F. Kennedy's assassination but did not show up. Then, on August 9th of that same year, the body of the 71-year-old Roselli was found in a 55-gallon steel fuel drum floating in a bay near Miami, where he had been strangled, stabbed, and had his legs sawed off. Accardo would replace John Connor's position as head of the Vegas branch in 1970 with Tony Spilatro. Spilatro had just become a made man in 1963 after making his bones with a double homicide in 1962. In 1974, the Los Angeles Times reported that in the three years Spilatro had been in Las Vegas, more gangland-style murders had been committed there than in the past 25 years combined. Spilatro's name would be placed in the Black Book in 1978. Accardo had been a hidden owner in the Sands, gained an interest in the then under construction Caesars Palace in 1965. In fact, through the 1960s, the Chicago outfit controlled the Sahara, the Hacienda, where the Mandalay Bay now stands, and the Fremont, downtown Vegas' largest casino at the time. Starting in the late 1970s after investigations, inquiries, and lawsuits, the Mafia began losing control of Las Vegas. This, coupled with the cultural shift of the 1980s and the era of the mega resort, saw the gradual end of the Mafia Rat Pack Las Vegas. To paraphrase T.S. Eliot, this is the way that the Mafia era of Las Vegas ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews talking about the Mafia's influence in Las Vegas. I know that there is so much more to cover about the Mafia's influence in Las Vegas. In fact, we wouldn't even have the city that we know today had it not been for organized crime. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.